Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're going to take a look at this big guy right here, which is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090. Now, this piece on the 3090 is going to be a lot different than many of the pieces that you've seen on YouTube on this card. And there's a big reason for that. At STH, when we review GPUs, we really are coming from more of the server and high-end workstation side of things, so we don't review for games. We care much more about the compute performance and, for example, how these cards perform on AI inferencing and training workloads than we do on playing games, so we just test on compute. So William has a review today on the STH main site on the RTX 3090, and we go through our full compute benchmark suite as you can go check out all those performance numbers there if you want to go look at that in a lot more detail than we're going to go over in this video. Instead, what I wanted to do was I wanted to give a perspective on what the lack of these cards in the channel means to, well, us, to you, and to our community. Unlike, say, 15 years ago, GPUs are not just toys to play games with. Instead, today, they're compute devices that are making some of the world's biggest innovations, not just in the data center. Instead, GPUs like these are used by those that are bathed in monitor light in the wee hours of the morning trying to get their new algorithm to work or come up with some kind of new innovation. If you use GPUs either at work or in research or your classes, then hopefully you find something in this video that resonates with you. If you do, or even if you don't, and you totally don't like anything that I'm saying, just leave us a comment and let me know why. And this view of GPUs as compute devices, for us at STH, we did some reviews previously, but really started to hit home about the time that people were putting 8 and 10 NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080s or 1080 Ti's into servers. And, you know, we were reviewing those servers. It was a just totally dynamic time that was happening at the same time as a big AI explosion and research explosion. And so if you were to go down into data centers in Silicon Valley, I mean, we saw just walls and walls of these four and five U systems with eight or 10 GPUs each. And they were just humming along, burning tons of electricity and creating kind of the new foundation that all of today's AI research is based on. I mean, this is all part of stepping stones. And that was an earlier stepping stone. After having seen that, you can kind of see why NVIDIA changed their EULA. But at the same time, I mean, let's face it, that's still happening these days. And since we were looking at the 8 and 10 GPU servers back then, we figured, well, why not look at some of the smaller systems, maybe looking at four GPU systems or even just single GPU systems. And so ever since that NVIDIA 1000 series, we started doing GPU reviews up and down the stacks for both AMD and for NVIDIA. We realized that there are absolutely tons of people out there doing gaming benchmarks, and we just didn't want to be one of those folks, so we want to really focus on the compute side. And part of NVIDIA's whole model is really enabling that small researcher. I mean, if you're a college student and you get a GPU, you can play games on it, but then you can also do your computer science work. And that's really a model that NVIDIA has embraced over the last decade plus. Now, these days, we tend to focus more on the bigger GPU systems. For example, I think a couple of weeks ago, we did a four NVIDIA Quadro RTX 6000 series server. That was a 2U server. We also did earlier this year, we did a eight NVIDIA V100 with NV switch. So the really high end SXM packages. I even have an old video on YouTube of me actually installing the NVIDIA Tesla P100s in an SXM chassis. And that was by far, I mean, that was the absolute worst installation experience I've ever had in a piece of hardware and compute hardware. So I totally understand why NVIDIA now has the HGX2 boards because that was horrid. Go check that video out and we'll link that in the description. At this point, we're basically waiting for our eight NVIDIA A100 system, and that's going to get shipped probably in the early 2021 timeframe. So while we're waiting for that, I said, hey, I want to go do Ampere really badly. And NVIDIA said, nah, we don't really send you G GPUs, especially GeForce GPUs. And I said, well, yeah, but it's going to take me a while to get one of these A100 systems. So do you think maybe you can get us one? And they actually did send this NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090 for us. And that's awesome because we did the, you know, this right here, which is the NVIDIA Titan RTX. We did single and dual configurations. We did single and dual NVIDIA Quadro RTX 8000 cards. William right now is working on a actively cooled RTX, Quadro RTX 6000 review. So, you know, we have a lot of data comparison points, especially at the higher end of the segments. 
Now we got our RTX 3090 after launch. It took a little while. Plus the other side to it was just that the containers that we were using, plus some of the scripts needed to change. We needed to wait for some updates. So it took a little while even for our AI benchmarks to even be able to run on these new GPUs, but we finally got everything working and William has the main site review that you can go check out. There'll be a link in the description below. But instead of going into the nitty gritty details that we go into and William goes into in that review, what I really wanted to do here was talk about you know high level specs, talk about performance, and then also so talk about some of the impacts that the RTX 3090 is going to have on the desktop and workstation market. And before we get there real quick, you may be wondering what the heck's over here. This is the Canon C70 and this is shooting the B-roll. So if you actually do see B-roll in this video, that's because of this camera over here. This is the first time that we'll be using it on a video. So we're going to see if it works. First off, instead of going into all the key specs, what I wanted to do is just flash up a quick table and just talk about the fact that the specs of the new RTX 3090 are absolutely massive. I mean, they frankly are more in line with what we would see in terms of a Titan RTX or a higher end quadro card of the previous generation, rather than really the GeForce gaming cards of a previous generation. The 3090 is frankly a completely different beast. And as we're gonna see in the performance side, these specs do translate into performance. One that I did want to talk about real quick was the power consumption. Now, William certainly found that we got higher power consumption as we expected on the 3090. GPUs are getting bigger, accelerators are getting bigger, and this is just an industry trend. And just as a bit of perspective, since we do do the much larger GPUs that sit in the SXM modules, we do see power consumption there that's much higher. And so this is kind of more like a last generation, one of those GPUs rather than something that's completely new domain for an accelerator. Also, if you look at the data center market as a kind of leader in terms of where these things are going, there are GPU and accelerator designs now into the, you know, not just 450 watt, but all the way up into like the six, seven, 800 watt range. So Although 350 may seem like a lot today on a kind of broader scale on the data center side, these are not necessarily the highest end accelerators that we're going to see over the next couple of years. To coincide with that higher power consumption, NVIDIA also changed the cooling on these as well. And they did a number of things. So first they made the overall card much larger. So now this card doesn't necessarily fit in just a double slot like it would in previous generations. Now the Founders Edition that we have here will actually span multiple slots. It's probably going to take up three in your system. And also you have limitations just in terms of how large your chassis needs to be because this GPU extends higher and significantly higher than the IO plate would. The cooler is also redesigned. So it basically does not work at all in some of the denser configurations that we've used before. There are blower style coolers, but NVIDIA does other things just to make it a little bit harder to put these in dense configurations. And a good example of that is the power connector. NVIDIA changed to the new 12 pin power connector and we have this little adapter, which I really don't like. The higher end data center and GPUs typically have one power connector and it sits at the very end of the card. That helps cabling and also helps you get very dense systems. And that's really just showing the PCIe slots kind of limitations, because what we're seeing is that all of the GPU and kind of higher end accelerator vendors are moving to something like an OAM or kind of more of a mezzanine type form factor rather than using PCIe cards. PCIe cards tend to be limited in terms of power and cooling. And so that's why they're just not as popular in the data center, especially as the power consumption rises. Frankly, even in the RTX 2000 series, we were seeing some thermal throttling when we were using blower style coolers with some of the RTX 2000 series cards in our review series. And so that's just something that as you're going to raise the power consumption, you would obviously expect that you need more cooling. And maybe it's just not as easy to cool as many of these densely as you used to be able to. And that in turn is why most of the servers are moving to kind of higher end cooling solutions. I've heard some people online say that the larger cooler and the new power connector are all designed to thwart people putting these into servers. I don't know if I necessarily believe that because the price performance of these GeForce cards in many applications, not all of them, of course, but in many applications is so good that often at smaller scales, the price performance is much better than the data center GPUs. Now, of course, when you scale up in some applications, data center GPUs are a completely different ballgame, but at lower end, they are kind of a lot faster. And because the price performance is so much better, the ingenuity that people have in order to get to run these GeForce GPUs into the more dense configurations is 
quite amazing, actually. I mean, we've heard stories and we've seen cards where people have actually paid manufacturers to move the power connector to the end, like a data center GPU on a GeForce card, so that way they could get better wiring and cooling. We also even ran a series back in the day on server humping, because back in the day, what would happen is that with the GTX cards, you'd have the power connector on top, and then they wouldn't fit into some of these servers. So what some of the manufacturers did was they said, okay, that's no problem. It's so much cheaper. So what we'll do is we'll just go make a lid and we'll put a little hump in that lid and that little hump will allow you to have your power connectors. And for a couple bucks, we end up solving this problem with sheet metal. Basically, the price performance of the GeForce cards compared to the data center cards and the smaller scales is so much better that there's a lot of money for innovation in terms of physical form factors. So as you've probably noticed, as I've been talking, you're going to have seen a whole bunch of charts and the black bars in these charts are going to correlate with the 3090. And as you're going to see, it's pretty darn close to the top of just about every chart. In fact, basically the only configurations that we had that were higher than this card are basically the dual configurations. I mean, we had the dual Titan RTX configuration. We also had the dual Quadro RTX 8000 configuration. And in a lot of cases, the 3090 is not that far off. But I did want to take a quick second and really look at some of the AI training and inferencing workloads because I think those are really important. Now, these are not necessarily the newest ones, but we wanted to show specifically was if we run the same workloads, what happens with newer hardware, because that basically shows what the performance is. If, if I have a application and then I'm going to just go and upgrade my hardware, not necessarily do a software change, what kind of performance benefit do I get from that? And that's important for a lot of folks, especially if you can get a large gain, which is exactly what we're getting here. Not only do we have the newer and greater compute resources, but with that 24 gigs of memory, we can often run the larger batch sizes that we need to to get maximum performance from those compute elements. You may wonder why we don't have the AMD cards here. We're still waiting for those as well as the rest of the NVIDIA lineup. And also just frankly, what we learned with the 2019 era was that a lot of our compute benchmarks didn't work because AMD generally has focused on getting their gaming performance right with their desktop cards first rather than getting all their compute performance. So it took generally takes a couple months until we're able to really do the reviews on the AMD cards and they just take a little bit longer because of that. So even if we had one, we might not even be able to run the benchmarks today. Of course, when we do get them, we're going to go do a main site review on those as well. So just stay tuned if you want to see that. Now, I just want to kind of call out a couple of comparisons here. And one is on the inferencing side. What you can see is that in many cases, the RTX 3090 is actually faster or about as fast as around four NVIDIA Tesla T4s. Now those are called NVIDIA T4s, and I always mess up the branding because ours actually say Tesla T4 on them, so that's why I mess it up. Now at MSRP prices, the NVIDIA T4 and the RTX 3090 are actually about the same price. Now, of course, the T4 is much smaller. It's a low profile, small card that you can go put just about anywhere and it's much lower power, all that kind of stuff. So this uses way more power, it's way bigger. But at the same time, for the initial purchase price comparison, they're about the same, yet you get way more performance in the 3090. When I discussed earlier, the students working on nights and weekends, trying to come up with some kind of new inferencing and application for inferencing, this is a really good example where this might be a much better option. The other big comparison is just frankly to this Titan RTX and the two Titan RTX numbers that we have on the chart. The 3090 generally falls somewhere between one and two NVIDIA Titan RTXs. And as a result, you think about it, this is a $2,500 card and this is a $1,500 card. And yet the $1,500 card is basically now slotted somewhere around one and a half of the $2,500 ones from just a year ago. If you are into the compute side of things, one way to think about it is that NVIDIA now for $1,500 is giving you what would have been about $3,750 worth of compute. That is an absolutely amazing change over just a short period of time. And just because of that extra performance, the demand on these things is absolutely huge. I mean, I have woken up 6 a.m. every morning since these cards have gotten released. And I look on places like Best Buy, Amazon, Newegg, and I try finding these cards and I have yet to be able to purchase one. And that brings us to what might be the meta question of today, which is really the scalpers. Now, scalpers have been in the press because they're using automation to go purchase these cards and hopefully turn them for a profit. And I guess that makes sense because, you know, if you're buying these Titan RTXs at $2,500 a piece and yet you get one that's one and a half, the performance of one of these for only $1,500, sure, of course you're going to go pay more for a 3090. But those people using automation to go buy a couple GPUs here and there, 
those are really kind of the low end of the scalpers. I mean, I get emails like this one pretty much every day from places in Hong Kong or elsewhere where people have, you know, dozens or hundreds of the GPUs and are offering to sell them, sometimes closer to MSRP, sometimes a lot over MSRP, and it really just depends on what I get. Now we gotta watch out for a lot of these shops because sometimes they don't necessarily follow through when you purchase things from them, but some of them are reputable and will send you cards. And those guys that are dealing in, you know, server components and stuff, they are not buying them on Best Buy with a script. They're getting them from their source way upstream. So let's take a step back and discuss some of the lessons learned and impacts of what we've learned from the 3090 launch outside of just the gaming community today. The first lesson learned isn't necessarily going to be exciting for a lot of us that buy these GPUs. And that is really that Nvidia most likely has just learned that it should not price this kind of halo level thing at, you know, 40% of what the previous generation is effectively on a price performance basis. They shouldn't price it at $1,500. They probably should have priced this thing at like $2,500, at least to keep demand in check. They could have started it even at 2,500 and then moved down market from there. They definitely are going to have learned that from a product marketing perspective. And so I kind of expect that in the next generation, they're going to do something like that. Because frankly, this is a product marketing issue that turned into a PR issue. And so they're probably just going to avoid this on the next generation. But to me, the bigger issue really isn't just the pricing. I mean, it's the fact that I firmly believe that the next set of applications that are going to change the world are really these AI applications that are going to be developed by people working nights and weekends on these GPUs. I think a lot of folks are familiar with the examples, but I mean, you know, like medicine, a lot of what doctors do in the diagnosis process is really just kind of getting data and trying to figure out how that maps to some of the research that's been out there. And well, that's just a giant data problem that GPUs are phenomenal at solving. So from a healthcare perspective, yes, I definitely want a doctor that has an idea in terms of how to go create an algorithm that'll help them do better diagnosis. I want them to have access to a card like this. Now in Silicon Valley, we're under lockdown again, and that really gets you thinking in terms of, you know, what are the places and experiences that you're limited to now that, you know, you can't necessarily go out and do all the things that you used to be able to. And taking a step back from that, I may have had those and access to those experiences before, but it really gets you thinking about people that don't have access to those same experiences. Another awesome field that I think that gets you thinking about is how can people use GPUs and some of the new AR and VR tools to be able to bring experiences that people normally couldn't get to even before this whole lockdown. I firmly believe that in 10 to 15 years, every kid that's connected to the internet should have access to every museum so that they can see some of the wonders of the world that you wouldn't normally get to see, especially if you live in places that don't have access to that kind of stuff. Oh man, I started tearing up at that last part. I gotta like pause for a second here. The NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090 may be large. It may use a lot of power. It may even play games really well, but at the end of the day, all of those extra compute resources, and memory resources can be used to do a lot of good for the world. To me, the tragedy of the scalper situation is not just the fact that we're probably going to see higher MSRPs on these cards in the future. Part of the tragedy of all these scalpers and what's happening is the fact that NVIDIA did a great job lowering the price of compute in this generation. I think that's something that most will agree with. But now, given this experience, what's most likely going to happen is NVIDIA is going to raise prices in the future, and that puts this level of compute and memory and capacity out of touch from a lot more people that could be doing a lot of good with it. Even all of those thousands of GPUs that are sitting on a shelf in a scalper's home or in a warehouse that are waiting for someone to pay a couple hundred dollars over MSRP are keeping this compute capacity and this new capability from the people that can really be making a difference. When I saw William's numbers, especially given the non-gaming benchmarks that we run, I knew that the 3090 had the potential to greatly accelerate innovation. I just wish that there's a better way to kind of bridge that gap between these GPUs at the prices that they need to be to go and really accelerate innovation, because I think that data center GPUs tend to be pretty expensive for what a lot of small scale machine learning research and a lot of research needs. And the demand on these cards from the gaming community and all the different communities that are after them make these GPUs force cards almost unobtainium at this point. I haven't even been able to buy one. But hey, I may be totally off here. So if you think I am, or if you also agree that you think that 3090 is a good card, but with not enough availability, then just leave that in the comment below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. And if you like this video, well, consider giving it a like. Also click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. We might end up having that 8A100 review on the STH main site before we have the rest of the kind of gaming GPUs. But that's just the way it is. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.